dog daddy from Dumas. And will watch me do my stuff. <laughs> Mr. Shepard, you're getting sillier and sillier all the time. In fact, the other day, my husband Charles and I were talking about that very subject. And Charles said he's certainly getting silly. Isn't that correct, Charles? Charles, are you listening to me, Charles? I said, Mr. Shepard is getting silly. You see, he just nodded his head. That's very good. Now, I, I just would like you to do a nice talk on travel through the Midwestern states in the summertime and maybe read Maud Muller on a summer's day. <laughs> See what a little sniff will do if it's properly controlled. Hello, test. Hello, test. Okay, it's important announcement time. Mark this down in your important announcement calendar. April the 7th. April the 7th. April the 7th. That is a Friday. And mark this down well. Red Bank, New Jersey will never be the same. <laughs> oh, man, I can hardly wait. Eight o'clock at the Carlton Theater in beautiful downtown Red Bank, New Jersey. We're going to celebrate the anniversary of the Great Orpheum Gravy Boat Riot. Me, Gene Shepard, live as a big, fat, round bottom bird. One performance only, so don't come whining around that you booted it. Now, here's how you get your tickets. From the Ticketron outlet nearest you, you can get them at all Ticketron outlets, just like the hockey game. Call area code 212 644-4400 or you can call the box office at 201-747-3800 Ticketron, get those tickets now April the 7th, 8 p.m. Carlton Theater, Red Bank, New Jersey it, Oh, we have such a sad story tonight and I know it shouldn't be told on a night like this you know, but I just gotta do it it's such a sad story and uh, it concerns the U.S. Army and any of you who are ever in the Army out there and any of you who have ever, ever had any feeling of compassion for those in the Army are going to want to hear this story. But the rest of you, you can just get right back to your David Suskind world. You can get right back there to the world where everything is sweetness and light. And so, before we do anything else, will you please, if you will, Skip, let us have our salute to the U.S. Army. All right. Oh, this is a sad story. And I'm going to read it just exactly the way it arrived from one of my spies. It happened at McConnell Air Force Base in Kansas. Now, that's a very big official base. You know, it's the kind that's about 4,000 runways all of them about 18 miles long, and they've got jets and everything else going there. It says, you wouldn't think that it could happen at McConnell, but an ambush occurred recently in the tall grass and weeds surrounding the runways. The assault, which lasted only a few minutes, completely devastated the hopes and dreams of a certain technical sergeant of the 2007th Communication Squadron. As this NCO was riding to work at the radar unit one sunny morning, it occurred to him, he's riding along in his Jeep, a couple of other yard birds with him, it occurred to him that the many acres of land between the runways, you know, all those weeds and stuff, could be put to use for the betterment of mankind. And what could be better than his own private melon patch? His dream became a burning desire. So he cultivated a little plot, planted seeds, watered, and nursed the plants. Until, lo and behold, he had many fine-looking melons on the vines. Well, he was overjoyed that just the right mixture of Kansas sunshine and rain had produced so handsomely 
but he decided to hold off his harvest until they were all fully ripe. It was a bad decision. He didn't pay much attention, but this same sunshine and rain had also made the weeds grow until his little tiny plot of melons, this poor sergeant, until the little plot was almost hidden from view. But the weeds were on the minds of others. Early one recent morning, a secret meeting was held in the base several engineer's office. It was decided that a frontal assault would be made from the south with a small task force of mowing machines. Their mission destroy. Out they went, and they wheeled into the line in assault formation forward. And them big old mother mowers just moved out there clipping them weeds. The sky was full of sunflower seeds, weeds, and the sound of snails running and hollering, little birds flying. But that great big assault line of mowers moved forward. The U.S. Army was on the march. Our hapless NCO, quietly sitting in the radar building, heard the strange rumbling noise coming closer. He ran outside just in time to wave the first mower away from his melon patch. But then the second mower appeared through the brush, and then the third, and then the fourth, and then the fifth. Although he was outnumbered, he bravely defended his melons from these mighty machines, driving them both off. He finally headed them off, and then at last he heaved a sigh of relief and returned to the radar room. As he started to enter the unit, he heard that noise again, the rumbling, and he looked around just in time to see the fourth and the fifth and the sixth assault mowers move up from nowhere without any warning and completely demolish his melon patch. Uh... the story goes on to say, if any of McConnell's jet pilots received a bad radar approach that day, and didn't know why, our NCO, the technical sergeant, was viewing the radar scope through tear-filled eyes. <laughs> well, wait a minute now. No, no just a minute now. I, uh, I'm not going to worry about that tech sergeant. I know something about tech sergeants. I ain't going to worry about him. Because I have had more chewing outs from tech sergeants than I would say any other single rank. Now, why is this? Well, it's the nature of being a tech sergeant. That the, he isn't quite a master sergeant who is above that stuff. First sergeants are somewhat remote. But tech sergeants are well above buck sergeants. And when you're a tech sergeant, you have that command, but you also still retain the what is the word? Ubri of the enlisted man. And so, oh, they're a bad lot, I'll tell you. Let me tell you a little story. You know, hearing this story reminded me of a, of a and this is going to be a sad story. Any of you who don't like sad army stories, you better get down. And this is the kind of story that you never hear uh, written by, you know, Norman Mailer. He writes about the war, the army. Uh, you read Joseph Heller. He writes about the war and the army. Well, as a matter of fact, alternately, the Army is more logical than any of these guys write about it. You know, it's, after all, it's human beings. Human beings have a certain modicum of logic from time to time. And it's also more illogical in actual operation because the, uh, the events, you see, events of life can never be actually recreated truly and accurately by writers or created completely by writers. Because what happens in life is far wilder than, you know, anybody can ever... Cause it, and here's a typical example. I've never seen a short story like this about the Army, and I will describe to you one of the blackest days that ever hit Company K. I mean, it, it, it became part of our company history. And once in a while, years later, we're sitting around in a barracks or in a tent or in a hole someplace, somebody would look out and, uh, by the way, speaking of, of great scenes of guys sitting in holes. One of the classic cartoons, you know everybody talks about Bill Malden's cartoons. One of the great classic cartoons of all time was written and created by this guy Dave Bregger. You know the guy that does Sad Sack? Well he did a classic cartoon about sitting in holes in the army, you know, in a foxhole. One of the great classic cartoons and, and if there was one cartoon that you saw stuck on guys foot lockers every place all over the world it was this one particular cartoon 
It shows Sad Sack, this little soldier thing. And he is in a hole. And you can see him sitting there, and he's got his helmet on, and the hole comes up around his eyes. And at some place, you can see the jungles behind him. You just see a lot of trees and jungles of palm trees. And there's a little sign that says, 301st Infantry Rifle Battalion, Company G. And that's their little command post. He's sitting there. The first scene you see opens up, and he's just sitting there looking out. The next panel shows a spider web is beginning to form <laughs> between the top of his helmet and the ground. And he's sitting there with his rifle, and you can see a spider web is formed now from the muzzle of the, of the gun to the ground. He's sitting there. The third scene now, you see there's more spider webs, and you can see a lot of dust on the top of his hat. And he's sitting there. He's got the sad look. And then the fourth scene, Jack, I'll bet you remember this great cartoon of Sad Sack. This one. Well, this particular one. And, and he's sitting in the hole now, and you know he's been there. You can see it's winter back of him, and then it's summer back of him. Same hole. See? It says 301st Infantry Rifle Battalion Company G. And suddenly you see a, a, a PFC crawling up to his hole, and he's handing him a paper, and on the top of it it says, Transfer. And you see... Sad sack, hooray, hooray, you know, the, he's, he's been in this hole so long, he's got spider webs from the top of his hel helmet down to the ground. He's cheering, hooray, 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 you see him jumping up and down, hooray, hooray, hooray. And the next scene, you see him now getting on a boat, and he's got a great big pack on his back, he's got all his gear, and he's got this big happy look on, on his face, and now, you, yeah, he's going, see, he's going somewhere. His transfer finally came through, obviously he's been putting in for transfer for four years out of his hole. And now you see he's unloading at San Francisco. And he's, hooray, hooray, you see San Francisco. And now he's in a pen. You see this gigantic pen, wire. And it says, reassignment center, restricted. He's not going anywhere. And he can see San Francisco out there. The next scene, he's getting back on a boat. <laughs> you don't know where he's going. It's like he's getting back on the boat. And he's still got this vaguely happy look. Obviously, he's going to this new outfit. And the last scene. Here is Sad Sack sitting in a hole, and you see he's got spider webs going from the top of his helmet to the ground. His rifle, he's got spider webs going from the top of the rifle to the ground. And you see the sign says, 301st Infantry Rifle Battalion, Company L. <laughs> Do you get it, Jack? <laughs> Did it happen? Oh, man. And that cartoon, I would say, that cartoon was in the bottom of more foot lockers than any other signal cartoon I ever saw. In fact, there was one phrase that went through the signal car. I don't know whether it was in your outfit, Jack, but there was a phrase that went through the signal car when guys were talking about transferring. Always somebody would be sitting in the barracks. Boy, I'll tell you, oh, am I going to get out of this? What an outfit. Oh, I can't even des describe to you the language that was used, you know. Oh. Oh, boy. Do you know what he did today? He's talking about Kowalski, first sergeant. you know what he did today? Nobody cares. Because what he did today was nothing compared to what he did to this guy, the other guy, the day before, the day before. The... Oh, something around. He said, oh, am I going to get out of this outfit? Then always there was the old soldier. We had this old guy who had been in the regular army, and somehow, by some fluke trick of nature, he wound up in Company K. And he'd be lying on his bunk. And he'd look up after about four hours of this, boy, am I going to get out of this outfit? Am I going to transfer out of this hole? Oh, boy, what do I get out of here? He'd, he'd raise his head and he'd say, fellas, fellas, look, you transfer out of this hole, and where do you wind up? Another hole. And not only that, the one good thing is you know this hole. I mean, you know how bad Kowalski could get. Has it ever occurred to you guys that there are guys in this army even worse than Kowalski? And you could transfer right into the den? The, 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 right out of the shark's mouth, into the saber-toothed tiger's mouth? Yeah, which uh, reminds me. And don't ask me why. This is W.O.R. New York, you know, word association. Okay, we have the book Fine People with us here tonight. And uh, the only way, they say, to judge book clubs is by the list of titles. Well, that's logical. The mass book clubs feature books that appeal to the masses, and the Book Find Club seeks out only the best of contemporary fiction and nonfiction, like The Game of the Foxes, Uncommon Sense, Memoirs of Hope by Charles de Gaulle, and so forth. 
So uh, if you'd like to join the club, you're, they're putting on special inducements now. They'll send you for only $1 plus postage and handling two extraordinary books that will cost about $15 at bookstores. Jean-Francois Ravel's Without Marks or Jesus and lawyer F. Lee Bailey's The Defense Never Rests. That's a dollar apiece if you join the club, of course. So call and find out about it. It's TN71441. And as a Book Find member, you're obliged to purchase just two more books in a whole year. The number is TN71441. Or send your name and address, no money, to Book Find, W-O-R, New York. Book Find, W-O-R, New York. Okay, you saber types. Uh, March 31st should be good news for most of you if you're a saver type, because on that, on that day, most banks will credit interest to your savings account. And that will be some at 5% a year, some as low as 4% a year. Interest is credited and available in most banks every three months. That's the key point. Now, the important question is, will you have to wait another three months before you get another dividend credited to your account? Well, customers of Provident Savings Bank won't have to wait because Provident credits their dividends monthly. And uh, Provident Savers get their 5% dividends posted to their account on the last day of this month and every month. And by the way, you can earn 5% a year from day of deposit, which is the highest dividend rate allowed by law. And you don't have to be a Jersey resident. You can join over 82,000 Provident Savers, savers rather, from all over the USA by their bank-by-mail kit, which is free. Just give them a call. Phone MU26800 right now, and they'll send you that free bank-by-mail kit. Operators are standing by, and they're a member of the FDIC. Oh, can't you see this great moment when you're sitting there and your friend looks across the card table at you and he says, Hey, Charlie, there's something different about you. What is it? You look different. And you say, <laughs> I've just come back from Madeira. <laughs> yes. You dip into the bridge mix and you look mysterious. <laughs> I've just come back from the favorite resort, the Winston Churchill favorite. It's a magnificent island lying off the coast of Africa, and it is beautiful. You spend eight days in the Madeira Hilton, which is a spectacular new hotel, and it's a tour brought to you by TAP, the Intercontinental Airline of Portugal. For $398, eight days, and that includes everything on Madeira, and it's really deluxe. And these tours include round-trip economy airfare, prices subject to government approval. You better call your agent right now, your travel agent. $398, and the sale ends April the 30th. The number is 421-8500. Madeira, no less. <laughs> And uh, I'm in Company K, see? And uh, we had this tall, thin, taciturn officer. And, uh, in fact, I can't even remember his name. He was a very silent type officer and a captain from West Point. And apparently, uh, the, the, uh, the sadness of being put in charge of Company K was enough to make him very taciturn. He didn't talk much. And he would sit behind his desk, and uh, he always had, the, what, <laughs> he had what they called pineapple jungle juice which meant that he had this pineapple, and he always had a big can, so that if, if, the, if the major ever walked in, the major would think he's drinking pineapple juice. And a great big can says, pineapple juice all over here, with a dole, with a green label, and the whole business, you know, it says unsweetened and all that. Well, he used to take this pineapple juice, <laughs> and uh, there were all kinds of rumors around the company all the time as to what he sweetened the unsweetened pineapple juice with. And uh, he... All day long, big can of pineapple juice, and he had a GI can with ice in it, with a can of pineapple juice right in the middle. And all day long, he would sit and sip out of this pineapple juice, and he'd drink it right out of the can. And uh, he became a very mysterious figure. And every day, we'd come in there, and then there's these inexplicable orders would come out, like uh, all EM of this command will no longer be allowed to wear field jackets until further notice. Well, the only piece of equipment that anybody in the Army liked was the field jacket. And uh, we were always being told we couldn't wear it. No matter where you went, you couldn't wear the field jacket. So, you know, this kind of stuff. The guys are sitting around griping. Little did we realize how calm and how beautiful things were until the day we are lined up. What are you playing with in there, Lee? You're, you're studying, you know, until the day came. It was very, very uh, 
nervous moment. Company K is all lined up, and our captain is standing out there in full dress, and he walks back and forth quietly in front of us. And he said, men, got a special announcement. He said, I didn't get to know a lot of you fellas. The past months we've been together. But I have a special announcement to make. And I think it may be of some interest to all you men in Company K. Now, I think you guys have got the makings of a good company. You ain't very good now, but you got the makings. We're shifting. What, what's this going to be? <laughs> what, what's up now? Because he had a certain solemn way about him, and he was wearing his green dress jacket. You know, the, the, the uh, blouse, the, the, the dress one with the pinks, jazzy hat with the big bird on the front of it. He said, men, today, as of 1300, this company is going to be in command of another officer. Uh-oh. Well, now, you, whenever a big change comes in your life, there are two divergent thoughts about it, no matter what the change is. One, oh, no, 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 what? Then there's the other one. Oh, wow, now things are going to really be great. You know, it's going to be better. Well, every company I've ever worked in, every radio station I've ever worked in, there are always the two things. When it is announced that there's, a, there's going to be a new manager, there are always these two thoughts. Now, the old manager ran the station into the red, we'll say. And, you know, they're having parties and the microphones are getting rusty and old, but somehow we feel secure with him, even though people are constantly griping. The minute he quits or goes somewhere else, there's this momentary elation. Oh, wow, now the old place is going to get on a ball. And somebody says, oh, yeah, you understand what they're going to bring in here? They're going to bring all this automatic equipment. They're going to have a radio station that's manned entirely by automated transistorized parrots. And they're going to do nothing but give the time and go quack, quack every 30 seconds. And they're going to have this automatic traffic control that goes down. And there's, no, there's not even going to have any people here. <laughs> oh, no, no, stop worrying, see? And the old, the old clown that ran the station was so great. And the, you know, the new one is always at that. Well, so here's the company that you know, we're being presented with this. For, for months now, we've been working under this captain. Everything's going, you know, pretty good. There are certain guys that had gripes. We all do. And so everybody goes into the john. They're all standing there in the latrine. Guys are, guys are looking in the mirrors, walking around. This is where all the talk would go on. That's why they called it latrine rumors. They were the, 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 the rumor factory really was the latrine. Hardly anybody talked about company business down in the day room or the order room. It was the latrine. And so you'd hear somebody holler from one stall, Hey, listen, I heard from a guy, a friend of mine, down at battalion headquarters, and let me tell you, you guys, this is authentic. This is real stuff because this guy is works in the department where they cut the orders. He's a mimeograph operator, see? He tells me that we are getting this officer from the paratroops. This guy is known as Bullethead McSnide. First Lieutenant Bullethead McSnide, he's made 45 jumps in Europe. This guy has got his hair cut so short that he's peeling his skull skin right off the top of the bone. And you think, you think this clown was bad. Wait till McSnide gets here. Then immediately all the guys are achieving, oh no, Bullethead McSnide. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the time for two weeks when this insane maniac from the paratroops did take over our company? And he had us up at 4 o'clock in the morning doing deep knee bends. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And he would finish with the knee bends. Then he would have us doing push-ups until 4.45. And then we did laps around the track until 5.30. Then after that, we did infantry drill until 6 o'clock. And then we had breakfast. And, and when we had breakfast, we had to sit at attention. Have you ever tried to eat Wheaties sitting at attention, friends, with powdered milk? Well... <laughs> And then after after breakfast at 6.45, we would go out and do what he called then casual PT, which uh, oh, I don't even want to get into that. That was it. That was nothing. And he wore his boots all polished. You know, he had the, well, so always it was a rumor about Bullethead McSnide was coming into the company. Then somebody else would say, oh, come on, what are you talking about, Fred? Don't give me that jazz. Now, listen, I got a friend down at regimental headquarters. He saw the order, and there's his first lieutenant who used to be a librarian, is being sent, and we're going to... I know, I know, what. Uh, I'll tell you who the guy's name. You know, the, the, the thing, these guys, every time there would be a rumor, guys would make up facts to make them sound better, you know. He'd say, I'll tell you what his name, I even know what his name is. 
All right, you want to uh, ask me? Smart guy? McSnyder. Ah, whoever heard of McSnyder. I'll tell you what his name is. It's First Lieutenant Weathers. Weathers. And I'll tell you where he is. He is now at McGuire Air Force Base, and he's in charge of the library there, and they're sending him here because it's a radar unit, and they don't want to, any of the guys that do PT, you know, get nervous. They can't watch the radar. It's going to be great. And then you'd hear the guy and the others talk, oh, blow it out, get out of here, don't give me that stuff, my friend, Donna Battaglia. So the words are going back and forth. Well, 1,300 arrives. If the, everybody's all dressed up, you see, this is a change of command. You've seen this in, in the movies, you know, the whole business of handing the command over. Well, I'll tell you how it actually works. We are instructed to get all dressed up. And that we're wearing a Class A's, the whole bit, there's going to be a company inspection, the whole jazz. And so the company is all shaved. Oh, I'm shaved right down because you want to get that first impression off. I got my collar all neat. And I got my tie tied. And my jacket is all neatly buttoned and a whole bit. And sure enough, at five minutes to the appointed hour, you hear the whistles going. And you see Kowalski walking around out there. Oh, crummy, rotten Sergeant Kowalski with his hat pulled down with the green sunglasses. Kowalski's blowing a whistle. And he's got this great big clipboard with all the names. You know, like a roll and the whole business. And I see our captain come out of the orderly room. He's all dressed up, and he's got a big briefcase full of stuff. And uh, we all line up. We're all standing there. He says, all right, company, attention. Prepare to change command. Hoop. Now, you don't hear that one very often, but that means prepare for the worst, men. Prepare to change command. Hoop. Company, at ease. We all at ease, you know, with our arms behind. We're waiting. You see the flag flying. You could hear other companies going around moving. Our company is changing. And then suddenly down the company street comes a Jeep. And there are a couple of guys in it. The Jeep is approaching. Little did we realize. It was fate. Fate in a four-cylinder Willie's Jeep. Fate, the avenging angel, was approaching, wearing rimless glasses. He turns the corner, comes, and here is this mild-looking officer sitting, sitting. And he's a first lieutenant. He's coming closer. And our captain is standing out there at ease, and he's got his first lieutenant exec officer with him, who is being transferred with him. And they're both standing there casually. And the jeep pulls up in front of the orderly room and out steps this first lieutenant. And the captain hollers, Company! a we all snapped to her. Ah. And what was so great about it is that our officer, who literally looked like, well, he looked like Gary Cooper, our, our, our original officer. He looked like the kind of guy, you know, who's going to take Burma single-handedly. And as, as I understand, later he did. Uh, <laughs> but he didn't do it with Company K. Uh, he, he, he was the kind of guy that would strike terror into the heart of any goof-off. He just looked like the kind of officer who was on the ball all the time. But this next officer had the soft look of a very, very unsuccessful nebbish, which is a great kind of officer to have. You know, he gets out, he's got this kind of white face, rimless glasses, and immediately he's all oh, for crying out loud. This is the guy from the library, you know? And uh, he steps out of the Jeep, walks up to the captain, salutes, the captain salutes him, and the captain turns to all of us and says, Men, I'm about to turn the command of Company K over to... Lieutenant Cherry, now I know that all of you men are going to do your best for Lieutenant Cherry. Lieutenant Cherry is a fine officer, and I'm sure that he's going to change a few things around here to suit himself. Any good officer do that. I run my company my way, and he'll run the company his way. But you're all good men, and I want to say, as I'm about to transfer out in one of those tear-jerking moments, you know, he says, well, I want to say, when I'm about to transfer out of Company K, I want to say to all you men, it has been a pleasure to serve with you. Wherever you men go, whatever battles you men may see, I'll always remember down in my heart that one of the finest groups of GIs that I've ever had the honor to lead and be part of was Company K of the 362nd Airborne Mess Kit Repair Battalion. And now I'm going to turn command over to your new officer. And I want all of you men to give everything you got to this man. Because this man comes with a great record behind him. And I know that you're all going to be proud to serve under First Lieutenant George L. Cherry. Company!
Cartage Hex! Well, somehow, for that brief moment, we felt like we were in the real army. I mean, we're all standing at attention. The officers are all saluting. And Lieutenant Cherry, our new officer, gives us, throws one of those smart Air Force snappy salutes. You know, the kind of casual one. He throws it to our captain, and our captain stands straight as a ramrod. He salutes Lieutenant Cherry and hands over the secret company records, which, by the way, contained all the various details of all the guys to watch out for, all the rotten guys and all the good guys. He hands it over to Lieutenant Cherry, and he turns and he says, Good luck, men. Good luck. And he salutes all of us. Hops in the Jeep, and he and the exec rode out of our lives forever. Down near the battalion headquarters, they turned left and disappeared, never again to be seen by Company K. Well, there we are, all alone. We got a new daddy. <laughs> a little did we realize how right that would be. We're all standing there waiting at attention. And Lieutenant Cherry walked casually up and down the ranks. Just looking, not saying a word. And behind him is trailing his executive officer, a brand spanking new second lieutenant with a shaved neck. That neck, you know, that's red. And he's six feet nine inches tall, a shaved neck second lieutenant right out of Fort Benning. A couple of crossed, a couple of crossed rifles on his fatigues. He's walking along behind the first lieutenant. Cherry's looking at each one's, each, each, each G.I. He looked right in the eye. You ever had that kind of an inspection? That's an eyeball inspection, they call it. He would walk right up to you, and I remember him looking me right in the eye. He just looks through those rimless glasses. I looked. I expected him to say, uh, give me the serial number of your rifle soldier. Something like nothing. He didn't say a word. He looks at Gasser's eye. I could hear Gasser, sharp intake of breath. He moves down to Edwards. And Edwards, you could see his knees sagging a little. That's the worst kind of... Can you imagine what would happen here at, at the station if every morning the manager came and looked right into everybody's eye without saying a word? Oh, boy. He just walked up and down the lines. And he finished. And he snapped a quick right face. He snapped out to the front of the company, another quick right face. He marched to the middle of the company, and he did an about face. And then he hollered out. The first words he spoke to us, At ease, men. Now, men, I don't know what kind of company that the captain's been running, but my company's different. The first thing I want this company to know that I don't only run a good company, but I run a beautiful company. Have you heard that word before, men's? Beautiful company. That means that I believe that a man who lives in a place that is beautiful is likely to have a beautiful soul. Now, I want from now on, look at this company area. From now on, I want you to field strip every cigarette butt you smoke. And any man found not field stripping a cigarette butt is going to get busted. And if he ain't got no rank, he just ain't going to get out of this company area for seven long days. That's number one. Any questions? What do you say? That is what they call a rhetorical question. Chris Metropolis is not going to say, does that include camels, sir? Or does that only hold for lucky strikes? There's a long pregnant pause while that's sinking in. And then Lieutenant Cherry continued. In addition to that, we are going to draw as of 0800 tomorrow morning. We are going to draw whitewash. We are going to draw whitewash brushes. And we are going to whitewash the latrine until not a single knot shows. Not a single nail head shows. And we are going to continue to whitewash that latrine until that latrine is the whitest, cleanest, shiniest latrine in the entire Camp Crowder area. 
Corporal, will you please take a note? Tomorrow morning, I want a detail to go down to the QM to pick up 10 gallons of whitewash. I will need 25 whitewash brushes. I want that detail back here by 0930. Any questions, men? Well, I mean, what do you say to that? And now, men, take a look at them ditches. I want you to look at them ditches around here. Look at them ditches with weeds growing in them. As of tonight, immediately following Chow, we are going to form up in ranks. There will be no beer hall tonight. There will be no going to the service club tonight. There will be no PX tonight. There will be no USO tonight. Starting tonight, immediately following Chow at 7 p.m., we are all going to fall out in fatigues, and we are going to do something about these ditches. Now, Corporal, I want you to provide these men tonight with 10 wheelbarrows. If you have to borrow them from regimental headquarters and QN this afternoon, I want you to get them. There will be 10 wheelbarrows. And there will be 25 picks. There will be 25 shovels. And I want all you men, and I don't care whether you've been on sick call for a week, you are going to be out here. We will find something for you to do. I want you to wear your dirtiest fatigues. I want you to appear in leggings, helmet liner, fatigues. You can leave your gas mask in the barracks. Any questions? Furthermore, Corporal, Corporal, I want you to listen to me about this. I want you to bring out what whitewash we do have in the supply room for use tonight. If we need any more, we will send over to Company G and possibly even Company M. All right, man. I want to tell you it's going to be a pleasure to be in charge of a company that has such a fine reputation as Company K. And we're going to get along fine. I've got one slogan that I've always carried forward in my armor career, and that is this. And I want you to listen carefully. You are going to hear this from me. You are hearing it. Are you hearing me? If you play ball with me, I'll play ball with you. Any questions? Well, what do you say to that? If you play ball with me, I'll play ball with you. Lieutenant Cherry snapped to attention, and the sun was hanging high over the company street. A new era had begun. A new administration had taken office. And all those old, quiet evenings spent in the day room playing pool suddenly had taken leave and flown off over the horizon. Those quiet nights down at the PX drinking 3.2 GI beer had disappeared forever. We were now in the new world. Well, the company went back to the barracks. I was in barracks three. And you never saw a more silent group of guys. It had hit with such a thunderclap that they didn't even have time to formulate their griping. It was beyond griping. I mean, it was, what are you going to do? Are you going to gripe when a tornado hits? All you do is grab what you can hang on to and hold on to the ground and hope it doesn't, you don't gripe. And so there were guys sitting on foot lockers, other guys stretched out on the bunks. Two or three guys sat there and scratched their toes. A couple of guys just stood, looked out of the windows. Other guys down there spitting in the black can. Not a word. Supper went just that way. We sat quietly and ate our SOS, little realizing the enormity of the 
of the task we were about to be assigned. After supper, we all fell out on the company streets and we couldn't believe what we saw. Our entire company, and there were a lot of floods in the Missouri area, uh, the entire company area was sliced up and down, and this had been for years, with great drainage ditches, maybe eight, nine, ten feet deep. Tremendous ditches, and they ran all up and down the company streets. And there, set up by every one of those ditches, were night lights for us to work with. And there were not only night lights, there was a shiny esplanade, a beautiful formation of wheelbarrows. And beside each wheelbarrow was a pile of picks and axes. And beside each pile of picks and axes was a duty corporal with his fangs sharpened. We fell out. Kowalski began to give us our orders. Lieutenant Cherry said, We are going to go down and we are going to dig up all them rocks that you find down there by the rifle range and we are going to bring them rocks back in them wheelbarrows. And we are going to line our company drainage ditches with rocks all the way. We're going to have the most beautiful drainage ditches in the entire U.S. Army. We're going to line them with rocks and we're going to paint every rock white. We're going, to, we're going to whitewash them rocks. All right, any questions? No, okay. You two, all right. Pound off in column of twos. Each, the man on the left take a pick, the man on the right take an axe, and every fifth man grab one of them wheelbarrows. And let's get moving out. We toiled. We slaved. I was up and down that drainage ditch on my knees carrying rocks. We did this until lights out, until the sound of taps. The next night, we did it until lights out, the sound of taps. And you know, there's a certain maniacal thing about that kind of work. You begin to get interested in it. Now, you know, has it ever occurred to you that a guy in Sing Sing, chopping up rocks, making little ones out of big ones, eventually forgets how nutty it is what he's doing and gets to, you know, he becomes an aficionado. He begins to enjoy chopping up rocks. We piled stones on top of stones, and we began to be artistic. We're painting them week after week, this went on. And every night, other companies would march past on their way to the PX on their way down to drink beer. And they'd look, and the other guys were there. Bark, 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 bark. And we began to have this pride. We had these beautiful, these magnificent white rocks piled up all the way. And what a lovely company we have. And then one day, out of the blue, it was announced that the major general in charge of the entire signal corps was going to inspect the camp. And we stood at attention in front of our beautiful white our magnificent rock line drainage ditches. The only company in the entire camp. And we stood out like a beautiful, shiny, new half dollar. Well, the Major General's command car swept down, up and down the company streets. And all of a sudden, he stood up on the back, and I'll never forget this, we're all staying at attention. He hollered, whose company is that? Who's putting all them rocks down there in this ditch? Who's that officer responsible? By tonight, I want all those rocks taken out of here. This is a uniform, this is a uniform camp. What is all this? What are they trying to do? Make rock gardens out? We're in the army. We're not having no rock gardens here. What is this, a ladies' tea party? All right, now move on. Move on, Captain. And whoever officer's responsible for this, I want this cleared out by tomorrow night. We spent 24 hours taking every rock back to the rifle range. And not only that, washing the whitewash off of every rock and replacing it in the original hole from whence it came. And after eight weeks of Lieutenant Cherry, we were right back where we started from, except for one thing. He was in the orderly room thinking up the next project. Hang loose, gay. Things could be worse. Things could be worse. Are you sure you want to transfer out, friend? Things could be worse, you know. W.O.R. New York, next, Lester Smith and the News. News and detail on the hour from the W.O.R. Newsroom. It is almost walkout time for a lot of union employees of the state of New York, despite a court order not to. W.O.R.'s Albany correspondent, John Kelly, reports. 
state Supreme Court injunction was served this evening on the Civil Service Employees Association, preventing them from striking the state of New York at midnight tonight. The state attorney general, Louis Lefkowitz, obtained the court order after the CSEA broke off talks with the state and refused to enter into a fact-finding arrangement by the State Public Employment Relations Board. We asked CSEA spokesman Joe Rouillet if the CSEA will call off the strike because of the injunction. No, we can't. We can't call off the strike. The only way we can call off the strike is by receiving what we consider a favorable contract proposal from the state. Because the issue of the strike was decided last week at our convention by a full delegate body representing all of our members around the state. And they said that if there is no contract, there will be no work. In the event of a CSEA walkout, the first impact would be felt at state mental institutions. Supervisory personnel and volunteers are ready to take over operations of the mental hygiene facilities if necessary. The majority of the 140,000 CSEA workers will not be working over the weekend. John Kelly, WOR News in Albany. State prison guards have postponed their strike deadline from this midnight until a week later. After negotiations today, Council 82, State, County, and Municipal Employees agree to the postponement.